Okay. Um, I suppose actually I probably should tell you a little bit about myself. I've, I've done everyone else's bio, so I'll do my own. Um, I'm a lecturer in optometry at Dublin Institute of Technology and have been since 2001, so 10 years now. Um, more so, I'm research involved for the past five years, so lecturing is less of my uh, responsibility, if you like. Um, but importantly, from uh, your perspective, uh, I'm an optometrist. Primarily, that's, that's my basic um, training. And I'm still involved in private practice. So for the past 14 years or whatever, I've been practicing as an optometrist and will continue to do so for the simple reason that I believe that um, for me to talk to you as an optometrist, uh, for me to talk to my students uh, as undergrad optometrists to understand you know, some of the issues that are going on, I think it's, it's important for me to keep in touch with that. So I'm going to try and translate that a little bit today. Um, and with that in mind, I suppose the, the, the title of my talk really doesn't capture what I am going to talk about today. Uh, we will deal with trials uh, of macular pigment uh, carotenoids in patients with and without AMD. But fundamentally, I want to try and change your focus a little bit. Um, how many of you here stock and, and prescribe macular pigment supplements? Most people, um, which is good. Why do you prescribe them? Is it AMD? Any reasons beyond AMD? Don't be shy. No? Just AMD? Okay. You're, you're not the person that should be talking right now. <laughs> um, the, yeah, the simple reason, the simple you know, fact is that most optometrists, ophthalmologists, whoever is prescribing macular pigment supplements at the moment, they're doing so primarily but for AMD, for AMD risk uh, or for existing AMD. Uh, and that's the way macular pigment supplements are marketed and so on, and there's a, a strong rationale for doing so. But as optometrists, I want you to really maybe cha change your thinking a little bit. I want to stop you thinking about disease as such. Stop thinking about AMD and macular pigment. Start thinking about vision. Your vision specialists, your vision experts, uh, everything you do is about optimizing vision for your patient. Macular pigment is no different. Whether you're talking about an AMD risk person or an AMD person, you're essentially trying to either improve their vision or preserve their vision. Um, for everyone else who doesn't have AMD or doesn't have any other ocular disease, you're still always trying to optimize their vision. Um, there's quite a few of you wearing um, specs. Presumably all of you got MAR coatings on them. Yeah? How many of you sell MAR coatings as standard? Every one of you probably. Why? Because your patients will see better with an MAR coating because there's less glare, for example. Um, how many of you prescribe polarized sunglasses? Okay, would you probably advocate, advocate so polarized sunglasses as being maybe the best type of sunglass? Uh, probably, certain conditions, certainly. Um, you would certainly you know, say that anyone who's going skiing, for example, or fishing or whatever, that you should be using polarized sunglasses. The reasons you do so are, I would say, twofold. One, it's best for your patient. You know, Fundamentally, they see better, therefore they're happier, uh, and you're doing your job effectively. Secondly, we have less importance today, but it's good for your practice. You know, you're selling an AR coating, you're selling a, a polarized sunglass, it's income for your practice, but that's important. That's why you're, you're in practice effectively. Um, macular pigment is no different whatsoever. Everything that a polarized filter can do, everything that an AR coating can do, macular pigment does the exact same things. It will improve your patient's vision, regardless of whether they have a an eye disease of multiple types, or are perfectly young, healthy, and normal. The possibility is there for macular pigment to refine their vision, to optimize their vision. So therefore, I'm not going to advocate that you put everyone that comes into your practice onto a macular pigment supplement. It just won't work. They won't go for it and, and whatever. And there's probably not always the need. But it's something that you should be really considering. And certainly if somebody comes in with any of the symptoms uh, or complaints that, that we'll talk about today, particularly glare, um, then you should be really considering using macular pigment supplements as standard. Uh, as I said at the start, I work in private practice. I prescribe these for these conditions, so I'm not just telling you these things just for the sake of it. I know they work, uh, and my patients find that they work. Um, and we'll come back to it again, but again, I, I want to reinforce everything that's been said about mesozeaxanthin earlier, that really the, the effects are very much enhanced when you have a mesozeaxanthin containing supplement. So, just to kind of summarize the, uh, what I will talk about, um, 
Very briefly, we'll go into the Macrobian overview. Uh, you've had a lot of that today, so we'll just fly through that. Um, Again, what I want to do is, that, is to tra change your emphasis just to think about vision. So it's macular pigment and vision, regardless of anything else. So I'll talk about vision in normal people. We'll also then talk about vision in people with eye disease. Um, but in every instance, you're trying to, to look at what, Im what, what impact macular pigment can have on your patient's vision, um, both in the short term and then in the long term in terms of preserving their vision. Um, we look at a, a variety of conditions, AMD obviously being the condition that has most been researched, and then some others, cataract, RP, etc. And then lastly, we'll just talk a little bit about how relevant this is uh, and should be to your clinical practice. So hey, we've seen these already containing uh, macrobic constituents or lutein, zeaxanthin, mesozeaxanthin, uh, sources exclusively from your diet, leafy greens, color fruits and veg. Uh, David has, has clarified that eggs are an extremely good source. Dietary supplements, obviously, also an extremely good source because... As we've already said, unless you're really eating truckloads of these vegetables, cooking them properly, etc., then you're probably not going to get the, the, the quantities that you would um, need, if you like, to, to necessitate a significant change in whatever symptom that person might be, be suffering from, or to reduce their risk of developing AMD in the long term. Um, again, you've seen this slide before, macular pigment. Um, looking at it from a slightly different perspective, we can see there's two important features from a vision perspective uh, that you need to, to uh, take on board about macular pigment. Here's your photoreceptors, okay? So this is light coming in. Uh, before it strikes your photoreceptors, it needs to travel through the macular pigment, which is located centrally at your macula, which is the, the part of the eye that gives you optimized uh, vision. This central pre-receptoral location basically means that macular pigment has the capacity to influence vision effectively because it's filtering light before it hits your photoreceptors. And that's the simple concept. Um, the macular pigment itself, you know, it's antioxidant capacity coupled with the, the blue light filtration. Uh, the very fact that this blue light filtration itself is pre-receptoral means that you have less of the pro-oxidants, if you like, because blue light, uh, as we've heard, causes oxidation itself. It, it enhances the, the process of oxidation. Uh, so getting rid of this before the light strikes the photoreceptors is a positive thing. Macular pigment doesn't exist to prevent AMD. Okay? From a Darwinian ecological perspective, it doesn't exist in the eye. The eye hasn't uh, selectively chosen these three carotenoids to be present in high quantities at the macula to prevent AMD. We didn't evolve to live that long. Uh, it's primary function is as an optical filter. So it works to optimize visual function. Uh, <clears throat> from a visual health perspective, again, we've heard about the generation of free radicals, which are really just the uh, necessary consequence, if you like, of the metabolism of oxygen uh, within the retina. All these other processes further contribute to that. Uh, this says UV light, but it's light in general, visible light being more important to the retina. Uh, radiation, smoking, UV, pollution, uh, David has mentioned others, obesity, physical exercise, these all create um, uh, enhanced oxidation and therefore enhanced development or increased development of, uh, of free radicals. Uh, in basic terms, what actually happens is that as oxygen is metabolized, it loses an electron. Uh, and therefore, an inherently stable molecule becomes inherently unstable. And that free radical then needs, if, if you like, to regain that lost electron. So it becomes energized to attack normal cells to try and source that, that free electron. So what that does is it creates this kind of cascade of, of our chain reaction whereby ultimately you get this erosion or damage to the cell membrane. And this is the, the, the long-term effect. So it's an aging effect, if you like. It's cumulative and it's chronic, as, as John was saying earlier. Uh, with antioxidants in the picture, however, antioxidants are uh, molecules that are freely willing to give, donate that electron um, to the free radical. And just by that simple step, essentially just neutralizes the effect of that, prevents this attack on, on, on cell membranes. Uh, the important thing to remember about the, the retina, Stephen has alluded to the fact that it's the most metabolic, metabolically active tissue in the body at the, at, at the macula. Um, there's other reasons why uh, it's almost the prime tissue, if you like, for the development of, of free radicals. The presence of high concentrations of polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are readily 
attacked um, and, and lose their electrons to free radicals. Uh, so all these things, the fact that it's exposed to light uh, as well on a continuous basis means that it's highly susceptible to the, the effects of and damage caused by free radical generation and ultimately cell damage. Um, <clears throat> in terms of its optical properties, uh, pigment is a yellow pigment. Okay, and yellow pigments will essentially filter out blue light. And here is the absorbance spectrum, if you like, of macular pigment. Now, this shows the combined effect of both lutein in the solid line, zeaxanthin in the, uh, in the dashed line. And what we'll see here is that they have a similar peak. Uh, it's around 458, 460 is the, 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 the peak absorbance of macular pigment. That's the wavelength that is most absorbed, uh, or most heavily absorbed. It also happens to be the wavelength that causes uh, or causes the most increased risk, if you like, of damage to the retina. So 460, 450 to 460 is roughly the peak of the, what we call the blue light hazard. So that's the wavelength that is most injurious, possibly, to the, the retina. Um, one of the key things about zeaxanthin is, and this includes mesozeaxanthin, if you see this uh, variation, if you like, away from the lutein curve, they're quite similar up along here, but up here, what it does is it extends the range of blue light absorption. So by having zeaxanthin, you get enhanced absorbance of the blue light further along up the, up the spectrum, up to maybe 520 nanometers. Uh, and again, that's a positive thing. So as, as John and, and David and Stephen mentioned earlier, mesozeaxanthin is the most powerful antioxidant. That's one property that makes it um, uniquely suited to, um, to prevention, if you like, of AMD and other, other ocular disease. But it also enhances the, the, the absorption of blue light. So it prevents more blue light from getting into the, the, the macular layers. Um, and by doing so, it has the combined effect of enhancing the optical filtration, so enhancing the image quality, if you like, but also it further improves the antioxidant effect, if you like, uh, because it further is, re is further reducing the wavelength uh, that are striking the, the, the photoreceptors. Okay, so let's look in a little bit more detail on its actual influence, um, in theory at least, on vision. Uh, so we'll look at a few basic concepts, such as acuity, glare, and visibility, and then looking at the visual health effects also. Because the two aspects to this, it's, as a basic optical filter, it will improve vision, but also by improving visual health, by uh, you know, being involved in, in, say, DNA repair, cellular repair, uh, etc., it can actually just enhance normal function, just simply because you have a healthier retina. Possibly also you might have just a healthier uh, visual cortex. So the whole visual pathway may be affected by, uh, by having more of that macular pigment. And, and the effect is twofold. Effectively. The optical filter plus the antioxidant effect equals enhanced vision um, twofold. Uh, photoreceptor sensitive, you all be very familiar with this. We have obviously have the three cone types, uh, red and green. Our peak sensitivity being somewhere up here between the two of those, about 555 nanometers. You have your blue cones then, which are peak sensitivity, peak absorbance in, in a much shorter wavelength range, and then the rods. So blue, blue cones and rods are very much more uh, blue sensitive, but in daylight conditions, we're very much more sensitive to, um, to the greenish light. Um, and essentially what, this is actually, it's a pretty useful adaptatory mechanism, if you like. In daylight conditions, if you imagine from an evolutionary perspective, you're talking about a blue sky background. So if you're talking about a blue sky background and you're interested as someone who's hunting or just interested in surviving and not being attacked by, by something, um, then it's good that you would be able to see something stand out from that blue background. So we were very sensitive to those blue backgrounds in daylight conditions. You just wouldn't see the, the, the contrasting targets all that well. So to take away your sensitivity from the blue and optimize your sensitivity towards other targets, uh, such as you know, food sources, green food sources, which are the source of macular pigment, then it's ideal that we're more sensitive to those green, um, green structures. We have no, uh, no blue cones at the foveola uh, for that precise reason. We're not interested in, in the blue in that region. Um, the only time that blue becomes important is, is at night time. Uh, we are, as I said, rods and blue cones are more sensitive than the red and green cones. So therefore, at night time, when the lower light conditions, uh, the bluish component becomes more important there. Uh, when we're talking to our patients about what is normal vision, you know, 6-6 six, six is generally the accepted norm. We know, we all know most of our patients will get better vision than that. Uh, some will get 6-5, some will get 6-4 even occasionally. Um, very few will get the 6-3 level. But in theory, 6-3 is pretty much around about what we should be getting. 
um, from a neurosampling perspective, if you like, the, the cone density packing that you have at your macula should be a, a, enough sufficient to give you this 6-3 visual acuity level. But I would say the, the percentage of people that actually achieve that is, is minuscule. You know, it's rarely that you will see someone that gets to that level. Most of us don't even test to that level. Um, but even to the 6-4 level, it would be kind of, I would say, definitely not the norm that someone is getting down there. So, um, so that begs the question, why? Why are we not getting to those theoretical <coughs> limits? Um, one of the reasons is chromatic aberration. And I'm not going to go into too much optics, but you may or may not remember this from your undergraduate days. In very basic terms, if you are as we are, sensitive to, most sensitive to green light, it therefore makes sense that green light is in focus on your retina. Um, just thinking about a rainbow, for example, the reason that rainbows exist, if you like, is the dispersion, variable dispersion of, of light. Um, the exact same effect happens in the eye. As white light enters the eye, different wavelengths are refracted by different amounts. And that's just all wavelength dependent. Short wavelengths, uh, I hate actually even mentioning blue, but you kind of have to these days, but light doesn't have a color necessarily, it's how we interpret it and, and what we call it. But the short wavelengths, the blue ones, are out of focus, if you like, in relation to their position on the retina. So if this is the retina here, the blue is myopically defocused. The red is hyperopically defocused. Chromatic aberration, however, is blue dominated. And what I mean by that is that the majority of the blur if you like, is in the blue end. There's much more chromatic aberration for, for short wavelengths than there is for the longer wavelengths. Um, so that defocus is about 1.2 diopters. So, you know, that's, that's a fair amount of blur. Uh, it's only about 0.5 diopters for the red. Uh, the combined effect of that is that you have okay, a green element of your target in focus on the retina. You have a blue out of focus aspect of your image. You have a red uh, out of focus aspect of your image. These combine and overlap on top of the image itself and you have this purple blur haze, if you like, that's overlapping your image. Now, that's not something that your patient perceives or any of you perceive or any of us perceive. It's just something that is there, and it's just degrading the optical quality. Your brain adapts to that, if you like, so that you don't actually notice that, you don't see that. Although there are certain instances when you can, we can set them up that you can, you can notice these effects. Uh, but effectively, you have, at all times, on your retina, a blurred image. You have the clear component, which is just the green wavelength, Every other wavelength is out of focus, and that's degrading the image quality. Um, most theoretical models and testing show that that's probably equivalent to about a quarter of a diopter, possibly up to half a diopter of defocus is the, is the net effect on that. And that's, so that's probably equivalent to a full line of acuity on the letter chart, and that's just from chromatic aberration alone. So that's probably the single most uh, significant factor that affects basic visual acuity as we would measure it. Okay? But as you can imagine, it has other effects. If you went and, and analyzed contrast sensitivity, for example, it's going to have an effect on that as well. Um, here's just an illustration um, that I, I put together uh, with some help from Larry Thibos in, in <coughs> Indiana. Just to try to kind of show you the, the effect here, we're, if we're maximum focus is in this area here in the green, you can see the blue is very much out of focus here. Um, the red, not quite so much but it is out of focus. So combining all those together basically just means that these letters individually are not as sharply focused by the retina as they should be. Uh, second aspect we need to talk about is light scatter. Um, I'm sure you know what light scatter is, but it basically is the scattering of components of the light. Um, firstly, in the atmosphere, the reason we have a blue sky is because blue light is predominantly scattered. So as with chromatic aberration, which is blue light dominated, Scatter is blue light dominated. So typical of what we call rally scatter means that blue light is scattered out of it and then we end up with this uh, blue sky. The same effect happens when light enters the eye. Uh, you have variable amounts of scattering dependent on a multitude of factors. For example, if you've got a corneal opacity, if you've got a cataractus lens, they're going to cause increased amounts of scatter. Just normal aging process means, again, more light scatter. Uh, so scattering, what it does is it causes this kind of veiling glare over images. This is just a typical uh, image, if you like. It's something we would think about. It's one of the reasons we would explain to our patients that they should have an MAR coating is because, you know, if you're driving, you're getting reflections off your screen, reflections off your, 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 your glasses, and all the combined effect of those reflections is that you have, you know, reduced visual performance. By having this coating on it, you're optimizing your visual performance. Um, so, <coughs> relating that to visual health, then, as... Stephen has, has clarified earlier, the, the retina is, is a hugely metabolically active uh, tissue, and particularly in the macular area. Um, 
all of this metabolic activity um, combined with exposure to blue light, for example, combined with the, the, the yellow pigment here is um, lipofuscin. So the, the development of lipofuscin, which is also known as the aging pigment, uh, one of the, I suppose, the bad things about lipofuscin is that it's chromophore. And what I mean by chromophore is that when it absorbs blue light, it becomes excited by it. It gets raised to a higher energy level. It becomes excited. And what it actually does is fundamentally leads to the generation of more free radicals. So blue light stimulation uh, of lipofuscin enhances the overall effect. Again, another reason why the retina is such a, a prime tissue, if you like, for the generation of free radicals and the consequential damage that they might cause. So all of these effects lead to free, free radical um, development. And then ultimately you have the combined effect of all of these. So you have oxidation going on. You have uh, resultant ischemic inflammatory process and possibly other processes that lead to this abnormal retina and ultimately AMD or other, other macular conditions possibly. Um, so essentially the, the fundamental message is that macular pigment has the capacity to do those two things. Going back to the scatter and chromatic aberration uh, aspect, macular pigment is a blue light filter. Okay, and as I've said, chromatic aberration is blue light dominated, light scatter is blue light dominated. There's probably some argument as to whether scatter within the eye is blue light dominated or not, but it's kind of almost a redundant argument. Quite simply, blue light is uh, scattered within the eye. Other wavelengths are also scattered, but that scattering component from the blue light is uh, or can be potentially absorbed by the macular pigment uh, and therefore reducing the effects of it. Um, so ultimately, the effect of macular pigment on vision will be some balance between these two hypotheses. It's optical effects on, on the image and it's visual health uh, effects on the actual health of the retina, the function of the retina, the function of the visual cortex, for example. So all these things ultimately mean that you have uh, an influence by macular pigment on vision. Anyone familiar with Nike Max Sight lenses or remember them? Anyone ever use them? Um, I never prescribed them. I know I did. I actually did for glare as well, and, and, and it did work. Um, this is a slide from, from Bosch and Lom. It's uh, obviously a, you know, a marketing slide, but it's actually you know, not really telling anything other than what it really did. Uh, when you put this lens on, it was a blue filter, uh, either type of lens, whether it was the orange lens or the dark green lens you were using. Uh, both of them filtered out predominantly the blue light, and essentially, uh, enhanced the contrast within the images. And it was marketed at, as uh, suitable for different types of sports professionals, for example. That was the marketing policy, if you like, behind it. Um, macular pigment has the exact same potential benefit. By enhancing that, you can do the same things. Um, here we have kind of foggy, hazy driving conditions. If you were to put on a pair of yellow driving glasses, um, and I'm sure that most of you have probably prescribed to yellow driving glasses at some point in time, um, the reason you're doing so is ultimately to enhance contrast, to make driving conditions easier. Macular pigment does the exact same thing, if you've got enough of it. It will enhance the, the contrast, if you like, between the background and the targets, the objects, if you like, whatever people are, are looking at. Um, light scatter, another problem. Here is, uh, this is a kind of a, an interesting one I, I found. Um, and it relates kind of to what we were saying earlier about environmental change and, and types of new types of, of lighting systems. Uh, this is an older design um, uh, light filament. These are the new premium xenons, and I'm sure you've all experienced it. Driving against them, you suddenly get this you know sharp blue um, tinge that that really does exacerbate your glare symptoms. And I'm sure you've all have patients who mention these as you know being more difficult to drive against. And the reason is that xenon contains high blue peak. The lighting in here and, and the older style candescent light bulb contained practically no blue light, uh, which was a good thing because you didn't you don't need the blue light. The blue light, as I said, is deleterious to your, your visual quality. So having light sources now, whether it's an LED, if you've got a white LED in your home or your office or whatever, um, it's actually a blue LED. But it's got a yellow phosphor coating over it, which makes it look this kind of lunar white appearance. But it's a blue LED. And it's got this huge peak at 460 nanometers generally around that region, uh, which makes it you know, right at the peak of your blue light hazard. So if you glance at an L a blue LED, if you have a, um, a fluorescent tube, again has a peak in the, in the blue region. UV is filtered out from fluorescent tubes. Visible light is not, so obviously you're getting this blue light. So what I think uh, and what I believe is that um, of the modifiable risk factors uh, that John and Stephen were speaking about earlier, 
light is the one that is going to become the most important one in the long term. Because for these environmental reasons, we've gone this new technology. Uh, but it just means that compared to, say, our ancestors 50, 100 years ago, who had very little light exposure other than in, in pure daylight conditions, we're now exposed to hugely elevated amounts of blue light in comparison. Um, and therefore, I think that the blue light component is going to be a strong driver of the development of AMD and other conditions in the long term. Um, but these blue light, they're also a glare source. So you're not just protecting against you know, the development of AMD, you're potentially reducing the symptoms of, of glare by having this macular pigment supplement. Um, this is a, a couple of slides taken from a, uh, a lovely paper on light scatter by um, Professor Billy Wooten uh, and Randy Hammond a couple of years ago, and it actually just demonstrates very nicely the possible effect of, of uh, macular pigment on the visibility of, of objects, of targets. Um, the kind of example that they used was if you're, for example, flying in an airplane and you're looking out the window, you're looking at a very blue sky. So you've got a blue sky background, but that's typical of, of you know, if you've got a, a nice sunny day, you're generally the background against which you're looking is a blue sky. Um, as you know, how we see objects is that they are different in some way from their background. So they've got a different, they've got a contrast, if you like, whether that's the luminance level is, is different, the color is different, or whatever. But if we take um, an object and a target which have the same relative luminance here at the start and no macular and no macular pigment, essentially they will look the same. They'll merge into one another, and you won't detect. If you assume there's no other differences between them, then you don't detect the targets. You don't see it. Okay. Now, if you have macular pigment. What macular pigment does, as I said, is it absorbs blue light. Uh, so in your blue sky background, what it's going to do is absorb the blue light out of that, essentially reducing the luminance or the relative luminance of your background in comparison to your target. So what it's doing is macular pigment is actually generating enhanced contrast between target and background. And therefore, what it does is just makes the target that you're looking at more visible. Again, this is an extreme example, but it applies to everyday normal kind of living kind of viewing conditions. Um, the difference that they show that in theory a one unit change in macular pigment could have a 30% increase in the range uh, or your visibility range and that, that's a range from 10 miles up to 13 miles. Um, a more realistic if you like from a supplementation perspective 0.5 increase gave almost a 20% increase in, in visibility range. Um, so macular pigment essentially will <coughs> because of this, improve all sorts of things that you would measure in practice, like visual acuity, like contrast sensitivity. They are the improvements that you get by me in measuring those just reflect, essentially, a target that's more easy to see against whatever background you're looking at, presuming that that background has some blue light in it. If it has no blue light in it, then uh, it, you're going to have no effect, because the macular pigment only absorbs the blue. Um, but as I said, the sky is the typical background, so generally you will have blue light there. Um, some other benefits that have come out in some recent papers. Uh, we are all aware now of wavefront aberrations uh, and their use in, uh, or their, their elimination, if you like, by modern laser refractive surgical techniques. The reason they try and eliminate them is because, again, they're trying to enhance vision, trying to make vision refined better. Uh, higher macular pigment optical density does the exact same thing. Uh, we're not sure exactly why, but it seems to relate to um, possibly this fact here, that your crystalline lens, which also contains the macular pigment carotenoids, by the way, they're obviously just not called macular pigment there, but there are um, traces of lutein, zeaxanthin, in your crystalline lens, uh, that it becomes clearer, and therefore the aberrations become re uh, more reduced. It also has dichroic properties. Um, dichroic properties simply means that, effectively, it works the same way as a polarizing sunglass. Um, the orientation of the molecules uh, in the retina, this per uh, perpendicular and parallel orientation, means that plain polarized light striking the retina is preferentially absorbed by uh, <coughs> macular pigment. So again, you're enhancing the effect. You have the standard blue light absorption, which means that you have less scatter, less chromatic aberration, but you also have less effect of polarized light. And as we all know, polarized light does seriously degrade visual quality. And when you put on a pair of polarizing sunglasses, you get an enhanced uh, image, and it's immediate. But macular pigment is like can ha has the same capacity. Other improvements then, uh, health right across ocular disease, decreased cataract formation has been shown, um, and a whole host of measures that relate to retinal health. For example, your, your CFF, your, your um, critical fr flicker fusion frequency, tends to be better if you have higher macular pigment, and it tends to be preserved uh, into older age. So uh, you've combined 
optical, enhanced optical, and health benefits. So they're all essentially contributing or potentially con contributing to um, enhanced vision. And this slide just kind of nicely summarizes it. Um, reduced chromatic aberrations, scatter, higher order aberrations, and other optical effects mean that acuity and visibility is better um, through this optical image enhancement process. Glare is reduced then by the dichroism, reduction of scatter, enhanced transparency of the lens, better photo stress recovery because you're filtering out the blue light. Uh, so acuity, visibility, and glare are all improved. And then visual health then is also uh, by, defini by definition improved through this an enhanced antioxidant activity, leading to the overall benefits in visual function. Now, so that's all the theory out of the way. Um, <laughs> and I, of course, I know you've all taken it all in. Um, looking at the evidence, uh, I, yeah, this is quite comprehensive and it's not really, uh, it hasn't been taken on board by practitioners because it's in the scientific li literature and that's not necessarily what you will read for your nighttime reading um, unless you do a problem sleeping. Um, but just as with AMD, the evidence is fairly substantial um, and it, it is in general suggestive that macular pigment does make a real and lasting impact on, on vision quality. Um, so the first thing we'll look at is glare and photophobia because I think that the evidence is most compelling in relation to glare and photophobia. So I really think that any person that walks into your practice complaining of glare, whatever the, the, the um, other symptoms might be, they should be on a macular pigment supplement. Um, someone who's had laser eye surgery, for example, they should be on a macular pigment supplement if they're complaining of glare. If they've got dry eye, for example, put them on a macular pigment supplement. If they've got early cataract and they're not going to have surgical intervention, put them on macular pigment. If they're going to have cataract surgery, put them on macular pigment first because you want to uh, enhance the protection of the retina behind that um, cataract when it's taken out. Because if you imagine, as Steve mentioned earlier, some uh, surgeons will put in a yellow filtering uh, IOL to essentially inhibit the effect potentially of blue light on the retina. If that's not done, and, and I would say uh, Stephen would probably comment better than I on this, but I think the majority of cases it's still just a clear crystalline lens that's put in. If you imagine a 70-year-old who has a fairly yellow cataractus lens, that retina hasn't been exposed to very much light, blue light, uh, for a long time. Suddenly when you put in this clear crystalline lens, uh, or Iowa intraocular lens, uh, you have the retina being bombarded with blue light all of a sudden and it doesn't possibly have the macular pigment to cope with that. So again, think about putting them on supplements beforehand uh, and keeping them on them after and st afterwards to try and you know, enhance the effect and, and preserve the, uh, the retina. And there is some anecdotal evidence to suggest that there is increased prevalence of AMD post-cataract surgery. Um, so there is a, a definite um, effect, it would seem. Um, so some of the Evidence going back to 2003, Jim Stringham, who's probably done the most um, work on this. Um, high macular pigment, it attenuates photophobia, okay, which is again something that co commonly uh, complains. If you supplement, it improves the threshold. So there is a, a relationship between the two at the start, and if you supplement, uh, you get enhanced benefit. Uh, photo stress recovery and glare sensitivity relates to it. Again, if you supplement, you get improved photo stress recovery and improved glare tolerance. Um, and these are very, very nicely conducted um, papers. The one downside, if you like, of those was that they were conducted in laboratory conditions. They weren't in what we call free view conditions, which basically means that, uh, for example, you want to know what the effect of your pupil, your normal pupil reaction is to uh, a, a, an oncoming light. So Jim Stringham has, has recently kind of taken the next step, if you like, uh, and using the, in these free view conditions, again, shown that visual discomfort and photo stress recovery, again, relate to macular pigment uh, optical density. Um, uh, in our COMPASS uh, trial, we again looked at a glare disability, and we found that glare in low-light conditions, which is typically the conditions that you would get uh, most glare symptoms, it does relate to, to macular pigment, and I'll show you a slide a little bit later on that again. Um, this, it, this is an interesting um, recent paper from uh, Jim Stringham again, which shows that if you have, um, he was trying to figure out, if you like, what is the optimum level of macular pigment, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a good question and something we would probably all, all ask. How much should one have if 0.4 is the average in the population? Is that enough or should it be higher than that? In relation to glare, there was two aspects investigated. Um, one was uh, the glare disability aspect, which is just, you know, enhanced glare effect kind of interfering with your quality of vision. And what he found that was pretty much around about a 0.7 optical density level was ideal. So that after that, you didn't really get more uh, 
uh, much more benefit, if you like, in terms of improvement of vision. So going from 0.4 to 0.7, it's, you know, it's almost 100% increase required um, from the typical um, average. Furthermore, looking at visual discomfort, which is just that discomfort if you are driving in and, and you come across those bright blue headlights, uh, what discomfort level that creates uh, in, in, in a person, he found no peak level. So right off the scale, uh, up above one log unit of, of uh, macular pigment, um, there was still benefit there. So basically from a pure vision perspective, 0.7 is, is the minimum, but ocular comfort, which is you know, just as important to people, um, potentially, you, know, there, you just can't get enough, is a simple message from that. So glaring photophobia, I think the evidence is um, there has been nothing really contradictory to this whatsoever both now in laboratory conditions and in free view conditions. So I think, it, it, you know, from my perspective anyway, I've been practicing it for quite a, a few years and, and you know, I, I believe it uh, 100% that it's a real effect. Um, this is a, uh, you'll probably have seen this uh, on one of my posters outside, uh, but it, it was a, an experiment we ran to look at the effect on S cones specifically. So rather than looking at, at, at vision in general, we just looked at the actual S cones, isolated those psychophysically, um, measured their photo stress recovery at the start, um, or sorry, measured, measured their baseline sensitivity at the start, and then exposed the, those cones to a bright blue stimulus to, if you like, photo stress them. You know, you're all familiar with the, the standard photo stress test, which is a kind of a, you know, it's a key indicator of macular function. If you've got a good healthy macula, your recovery time is generally quite short. If you've got a diseased macula, such as an AMD, then you're likely to have a significantly increased photo stress recovery time. Uh, what we found was that if you've got more macular pigment, you're likely to recover much, much faster to a, a blue light source. So if you are driving at nighttime, someone comes down you with their full headlights into you, your, your bleaching time in the retina, if you like, the, the disability that that induces when you are driving, which can be quite dangerous, is likely to be lower if you've got more macular pigment. Um, you know, other effects will come into play there. If you have a cataract, or for example, the, the effect is likely to be enhanced. Um, contrast sensitivity. Uh, it's probably not something that we measure enough in clinical practice. Um, the evidence is a little bit less uh, clear here. There's uh, a couple of early studies um, Engels uh, in the States, um, Hannah Bartlett in the UK, uh, both looked at, at these. Uh, Michael Engels found no relationship with baseline with macular pigment levels. Hannah Bartlett uh, found that if you supplemented with lutein that you didn't get an enhanced benefit. Both studies are fairly significantly flawed. Um, for example, Hannah Bartlett uses the Pelly robson chart. You're probably familiar with that. Pelly robson really just measures one spatial frequency, and I don't want to get too technical at all, but essentially it's uh, really a, kind of a pretty poor test and not likely to be able to show any effect of, of macular pigment. So it was just flawed to start out with. Um, Wong in 2009 did quite a nice paper, and they just modeled macular pigment using filters, so almost like a, a spectacles, if you like, to put over the eye. Um, and a 0.5 increase in macular pigment resulted in a 40% increase in, uh, in contrast sensitivity. Um, Lisa Renzi, who'll be here at the um, scientific conference, has shown the contrast thresholds relate to MPOD. Uh, again, with, with Billy Hammond, uh, has shown more or less the same thing, that contrast enhancement is created, if you like, or caused by macular pigment. Um, and we published a paper last year, which again shows that in lower light levels, your contrast sensitivity relates to, to macular pigment um, at baseline. Uh, there hasn't been enough work done probably on supplementation, but that's something we're involved in at the moment. Um, and again, I think Mackie Shield, um, with its mesozeaxanthin will make um, a significant difference on that. One of the things with, it's, it's come up a couple of times, mesozeaxanthin has, is the most central of the, the three carotenoids in the retina, if you like. So where we're most interested or most are getting our, our best, highest quality vision, that's where you find mesozeaxanthin. The lutein is more peripheral, so it's less important, if you like, from a, a critical vision um, perspective. So again, it just kind of highlights the importance of getting that. Visual acuity, again, a little bit variable. Um, these are all, I should state that all these are all normal, young, healthy, normal people. None of these have disease of any form whatsoever. Um, gap acuity and vernier acuity, not influenced by it. Again, Michael Engels, again, big flaws with the, with the paper um, and the design. Um, Hannah Bartlett, again, didn't find the, it was affected by lutein supplementation. It only had six milligrams of lutein in it, um, and 
no mesozeaxanthin, so again, limited. Um, we have found consistently, and consistently throughout pilot studies, um, through COMPASS, which was a, a proper placebo-controlled randomized um, clinical trial, um, more recent studies that we've done that aren't published as of yet, so I won't be speaking about, but they're all consistently showing that visual acuity is enhanced if you have more macular pigment. Um, and I'll show you a slide. <coughs> I'll just show it to you now, actually, while we're here. Um, this was the um, baseline relationship between macular pigment and visual acuity in our COMPASS trial. And it actually, it was pretty much a five letter, this was done using a Bailey Lovey chart, five letter difference between minimum macular pigment levels versus maximum macular pigment levels. So that's a full line on the letter chart uh, was the difference. These are all high acuity. 100 here is, uh, we use a visual acuity rating, we converted 66 acuity if you like to be 100. 66 plus one was 101 and so on up along. Uh, so everyone here had the lowest acuity value we had was 66 minus one. So everyone had very high acuity, but even at these 6.5, 6.4 levels, we did find an influence that macular pigment was facilitating that. Um, and lastly, in the normal trials, uh, ocular health effects have again been pretty uh, widely reported, uh, and a quite a, a variety of them. S cone are, are blue cones. Um, the losses um, of these, which are associated with age, generally as you age, you know, when you get into your mid-60s, generally it's expected that you will lose some level of visual function. And I say expected because that is what traditionally happens. Um, macular pigment, it seems, has the capacity to delay that. Um, and these are just normal delays. You know, my father, for example, he's uh, in his mid-60s now, but he will almost refuse to drive at night time. Um, he happens to have low macular pigment levels. Um, he has other issues as well, but um, which I won't go into. But uh, um, but it's fairly typical that in people in that age group, 60s, 70s, or whatever, nighttime driving becomes problematic for them, even in younger people too. Um, so that may be related to this S cone sensitivity, because as I said S cones are more important at nighttime, uh, as your as are your rods. There will be targets that your cones are are able to see at nighttime. Um, so your S cones are important. Um, Cataract as well. Uh, Billy Hammond uh, did a nice paper which showed that um, having higher macular pigment may retard the changes in lens density. So you get, and there's been a few other papers here, Chaz and Tabor and Brown, both shows decreased levels of cataract formation in association with high levels of macular pigment. Um, Billy Hammond has shown that CFF, which is a, a good indicator of retinal health, your, your flicker fusion frequency does decline in normal people who have no disease as such as you get older. Uh, again, independent of age, we showed that it was shown that macular pigment um, appears to attenuate that effect, so you, get, um, you don't get the loss in CFF. Um, again, Lisa Renzi has shown the similar thing, the temporal vision in CFF, these are positively related to MPOD. So more macular pigments you have, the better your ability to detect flicker is. And the, with, the Hammond, or with the Hammond and Witten paper, that seems to be maintained into older age. Um, there's a paper actually at the, at the scientific conference coming up, which again goes back to the short wavelength uh, system, showing benefits for that. Um, so COMPASS, I said this is probably the most significant um, visual function, visual performance trial that's been conducted so far and published, if you like. Uh, I said we're working on, um, on some at the moment in association with the Howard Foundation. Uh, but 120 subjects, 60 on, on um, active uh, macular pigment supplement, 60 on placebo. We looked at visual acuity, contrast sensitivity, glare disability, full stress recovery, color vision, macular pigment, visual experience. Because again, as a practitioner, I'm not necessarily only interested in seeing that someone's contrast sensitivity is better or their visual acuity is better. I'm interested in them telling me that yes, I see better or yes, I have less glare problems. Um, and so that's, that's an important component of what we do in all our research studies. We've seen the, the, the best corrective visual acuity. Um, these are contrast thresholds, so this um, inverse relationship, if you like, means it's a positive effect. So you're getting enhanced contrast sensitivity uh, in association with um, higher levels of macular pigment. Um, subjective glare, again, this is patient subjective uh, experience, and this ties in with what, uh, what Jim Strangham has shown, that more macular pigment you have, the better glare performance you have. Um, this was the result of the supplementation, if you like, in their analysis, we divided, uh, as John had shown previously in one of his studies, we similarly did here, divided our macular pigment groups into those who ended up with still low macular pigment versus medium versus high. Um, and what we found was that 
uh, we found significant differences. Even though there's only two matters here, it's still a significant difference between uh, acuity in those with high macular pigment versus low. Contrast sensitivity was more substantial effect, almost 30 5% difference uh, in contrast sensitivity. Light dark adaptation, this was again subjectively perceived and contrast sensitivity in, in low light levels. So again, across the board, we're getting improvements as a consequence of supplementation. So at the baseline, we find a relationship. If we supplement them, we find an enhanced benefit. Okay. Um, so I said they're all normal observers, young healthy people, which is why I would advocate that you don't think about disease as such. You think about vision, and it's <coughs> vision either in someone who doesn't have pathology or it's vision in someone who does have pathology. Uh, so first, just talking about hereditary retinal degenerations. There's been a lot of work done in the past. There's a lot of work done in the 50s and 60s um, around retinitis pigmentosa. Um, there was some variability, but the majority of them showed some benefit, that lutein or lutein um, dipalmitate had, had an influence, if you like, on retinal function, and that it preserved retinal function in patients with retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, there's been a recent trial, which is probably, this probably provides the most conclusive evidence, if you like, a four-year clinical trial, lutein supplements in, in RP. They also had, were on vitamin A supplements. Um, but the conclusion was that uh, essentially the use of 12 milligrams of lutein would slow visual field loss among non-smoking adults with RP. Um, who are also taking vitamin A. Uh, so that's quite a, uh, a, you know, quite a, an important finding, I would think. It's not something you would intuitively think should be affected by lutein. As we know, lutein is dominated at the macula. RP, you know, tends to be, and, and even the, the results here are showing that it's, it's mid-peripheral visual field loss that it's influencing. But when we say that macular pigment is at the macula, it's optically detectable at the macula. I said it's also the crystalline lens. It's also likely to be in the peripheral retina as well. It's just not at optically detectable levels, but it's there. Um, and therefore, it has the capacity to have some antioxidant uh, activity there and <coughs> presumably preserving some visual function. Um, AMD. There is a huge amount of evidence on AMD. Um, uh, my research student, Sarah Pickett, has a poster outside which you've no doubt reviewed and answered questions on now which uh, will shortly be accepted into, we hope, into uh, full publication, which explores all of the evidence that's out there, all of the valid evidence. Um, I'm only going to talk about randomized control trials. They're generally accepted as the most you know, scientifically valid forms of evidence, but nonetheless, other forms of evidence are, are you know, uh, very much worth taking into consideration uh, in terms of how, you, how it influences your practice. Um, so we'll look at three three studies in particular, and we'll just do this very briefly now. Um, but the last study, Karma and ARIDS. Um, the last study, double-masked, randomized, placebo-controlled trial, so again, properly designed, 90 patients, quite a small subject number, which would be one of the main criticisms, um, divided into three groups. Um, group one was lutein, group two, lutein plus antioxidants, and group three then, uh, placebo. 12-month follow-up, um, and it was on atrophic AMD patients. <coughs> And here's just some of the uh, effects. This is uh, showing the effect on macular pigment. So in this AMD, atrophic AMD group, we found that um, this is the right eye pre-supplementation, right eye post-supplementation. So macular pigment levels are up there about a third almost. Um, the same in the left eye, same effect. This is the, the lutein group, lutein plus antioxidants. Um, possibly even a, a greater effect um, here in this eye at least, uh, similar magnitude here. In the placebo group is actually a loss of, of macular pigment, which is, again, not, um, it wouldn't seem to contradict either intuition or the evidence that you would expect that as AMD progresses, there probably is a loss of, of macular pigment. Um, this graph just looks at contrast sensitivity. Um, and don't worry about the detail too much, but essentially all these bars here are just showing the contrast uh, across different spatial frequencies is improving. This is baseline level, this is improvement. Again, improvement, lutein and antioxidant. Probably more substantial in the lutein plus anti uh, antioxidant, but looking at the two in comparison, there's no statistical significant difference between them. Um, placebo group, you have some disimprovement, some improvement, nothing significant. That would be just normal variability, if you like, um, that you would expect to see if you take contrast sensitivity measured on day one and you measure it again on day two, you would expect to see just some variability in what actual level you get. That's all you're seeing there. 
Um, so what LAST showed ultimately was uh, in groups either on lutein or lutein plus antioxidants, they got improved visual acuity, um, about five letters again, so about a line improvement, improved contrast sensitivity, improved photostress recovery, and the AMSR grid, if you like, how the patient mapped the effect of the distortion, metamorphopsia, or whatever was affecting the AMSR grid there, was significantly reduced in the, uh, in the supplementation groups. So a, it's a key study, if you like, that, that really um, proves the principle to an extent that macular pigment can impact on vision in AMD or eye disease. Um, karma, which, as Stephen has mentioned, has been submitted for publication uh, very recently to ophthalmology. Um, this was a much bigger trial, 433 subjects uh, enrolled, 216 active, 217 placebo, again double masked, randomized, placebo controlled. Duration was minimum 12 um, to 36 months follow-up. Uh, again, these were patients with early AMD, vision was better at the outset than 612, and supplemented 12 milligrams lutein uh, plus uh, zeaxanthin plus antioxidants. And the two main outcome measures that, that Karma was looking at was visual acuity, um, at 12 months duration, there was uh, essentially no real difference uh, between the two groups. But as you can see, as time is passing on, this is number of letters, if you like, uh, difference between the two groups. In the active group, vision was five letters better um, at three years duration compared to the group who were on the placebo. Um, this is a uh, chart which just maps the survival, if you like, or the progression rate of AMD. And you can see the red line here in illustrating that there is lower progression um, to the more severe stages of AMD in the group that were on the active product. So acuity is better, vision is better. Morphological progression of disease is better, if you like, in, in the presence of macular pigment supplementation over that time course. I probably should point out that the numbers at the end here were quite small in comparison to the enrolled, but still a, um, a significant number. Um, Arids, I can't really not mention Arids. Arids, though, didn't contain any macular pigment carotenoids, um, but it does, or essentially it did prove the, the principle that antioxidant supplementation in general can have a positive impact on, on AMD. Um, huge number of subjects, five-year minimum follow-up, uh, again, excellently designed from that perspective. Um, the main outcomes are antioxidants alone, 17% reduced risk uh, of progression. Zinc alone, 21%, uh, essentially probably not much difference here. Antioxidants plus zinc, 25% reduced uh, progression. Only in the more advanced stages of AMD. It didn't show in the early stage in normal, or in the uh, control group and in the uh, earliest AMD, it didn't show that significant um, effect. But um, ARIDS 2, which is now being conducted, has included uh, lutein and zeaxanthin also to, to determine whether macular pigment supplements um, can, can have an impact also. It doesn't, unfortunately, include mesozeaxanthin. So again, that would probably be a significant flaw uh, in terms of, uh, of the ARIDS2 design. Uh, but we await to see what the conclusions of that will be. Um, OK, so with all that in mind, um, to kind of briefly summarize, you know, effectively, macular pigment has an influence on vision, and that influence is regardless of whether that person is a young, healthy, normal person, or whether they are a young, diseased person, or an older AMD sufferer. There is the capacity for macular pigment to make a significant uh, improvement in terms of their vision quality. Um, why do we need to worry about the younger population? John has really touched on this. Um, aging population. John's mentioned that about 50% of females born today will live to be 100. That's kind of scary. Um, all those mothers-in-law and stuff. But, uh, um, the population is also increasing, so we have more people living, uh, living longer. Poor dietary habits. The modern diet really doesn't um, provide us with the macular pigment levels, carotenoid levels that we, we should be getting, and other factors. Dave's mentioned obesity, for example, being um, so prevalent. Um, an increased lifetime exposure to blue light, which I think is a hugely significant factor. All of these things are leading to and will continue to lead to a continued explosion of AMD. Um, so therefore, it, it becomes, you know, there's an onus, I would think, on optometrists as the primary care practitioners. Really the only people, the only professional properly positioned to really have a critical impact on those both, both those aspects, the visual quality, of your patients, reducing the symptoms that they might be complaining of, but also reducing the prevalence of AMD in the long, long term. And um, true 
proper prevention risk analysis strategy um, and dealing with that um, appropriately. Um, this is a, I just put this in because I think it's a, just a really nice slide which captures everything that macular pigment really does. When you don't have it, you get more free radicals, you get more blue light in, which stimulates the development of even more free radicals. You get more blue light going in, which interferes with the vision quality from an optical perspective and from a health perspective. You get your macular pigment in here, enhance it up, you get much less blue light going in here, much less development of free radicals. You have antioxidants then to deal with the presence of those of those free radicals that are developed. So essentially the aging, the normal aging process can be reduced. And the optical benefit here means that the vision can be refined and enhanced um, significantly. Um, quite a number of additional areas that, um, that I would you know, think about routinely in, in, in my practice. Glare is the biggest one, as, as I've said. Anyone who's got diabetic retinopathy, again, you know, they often lead on to uh, diabetic macular disease. Um, again, diabetic patients can often complain of, of glare. Cataract, I've mentioned, supplementation pre and post-op. Um, even someone who has early cataract who's not uh, going for surgery. Cystic fibrosis we talk, talked about a little bit earlier. That implies to and really any kind of nutritional or digestive disorders where carotenoid absorption or fat absorption or whatever it might be is likely to be affected, that we should consider supplementing with macular pigment um, carotenoids in, in these cases. Um, this is from, again, my other poster outside, just to show you that, reinforce that, uh, although we, we spoke earlier about, Richard Bone was talking about what, um, how macular pigment, how long it remains stable in the eye. This is a, a eight-week deprivation trial, so there was no supplementation involved as such, so it makes it a little bit different. This is the routine levels of macular pigment. Over the first week deprivation, no effect. Then by two weeks and by three weeks, you see a massive dropout of macular pigment um, centrally and right across the full spatial profile. So it's about almost um, a 43% reduction right across the, the spatial profile, which is a huge effect. What that shows is that you really, from a normal dietary perspective, you need to maintain a healthy, normal diet um, routinely. And things like the Atkins type diet, which, um, which advocates kind of say a protein rich um, vegetable, if you like, or carbohydrate um, uh, reduced um, load has the capacity to really um, influence your, your macular pigment levels. Uh, and fad dieting now is so popular that you have people coming on and off, on and off diets, etc., that that's just not really good for ocular health in, in general. Um, so, just to conclude, um, Evidence suggestive of a benefit of MP supplementation in AMD and other ocular disease, but I think the most significant role uh, for vision may rest on its potential to retard the aging process. So you get optically better vision and you get long-term, long longitudinally preserved vision into old age. And let's face it, you know, as we all kind of get a bit older, retire or whatever, vision becomes more important possibly, kind of some of our habits um, uh, some of the maybe hobbies that we would take up so will rely on normal, good quality vision. And the better that is, the, the more social independence, if you like, that you're likely to have as you get there. And that's, as I said, independent of disease. So that's the last really key message that I want to get across is stop thinking about macular pigment and AMD and disease. Start thinking about macular pigment and vision and how you can enhance your patient's vision um, also have the added benefit of, of enhancing your macular pigment practice, if you like. So you're selling more supplements, you're making a better profit, but your patients are benefiting, and that's the real um, key message. Thank you very much.